Alan laid out some of the background to what we're doing. Over the seven and a half years between April 2004 and November 11, Premier showed a 7,300% return on investment in its ordinary shares. It was 73 times what it was when we got there. This was the highest of any other company listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And keep in mind that this is not a startup company. This is a 160-year-old staple food um, company. The math of that return is quite simple. Throughput needs to go up. There were some increases, but there were also some significant increases in, in throughput per unit. Operating expenses uh, came down. When we got there, there was really some significant waste, not even local optima, just waste. Investment in our case actually came down. And here I think is, is one of the most significant under-marketed advantages that TOC holds, is it allowed us to avoid significant capital investment. Return on equity, therefore, is equal to return on capital, which you know, times leverage. Alan already referred to the fact that we did a management buyout in 2006. Um, we did that predominantly with debt. We were fairly confident that we could make this company perform, so we were not scared of the debt. So it's fairly simple. We combined operational leverage and financial leverage, and that's what drove the value for us. Well, I found early late in 2009, and I'm still tired of this. Throughput margins are too low. We, it's not the ideal company to do this. He listened to me, he said, get on the plane immediately. We did so, and through the early part of 2010, we decided to joint venture on, on buying an, a, a, an apparel retail company in Europe. Alan was an integral part of, of that planning. Uh, lots of st strategy and tactics tree going on at the time. But unfortunately, first we had to sell Premier, and I had to find a successor we had to hand over uh, properly. And unfortunately, as you know, uh, it was a bad time. We, just, we literally just ran out of time, so we could never do it. Let me just go through some suggestions in terms of what we learned and what we're doing these days. I would not waste my time again with a company that is not, does not respond fast. So which companies respond fast? Find companies with high throughput percentages. We're working with an apparel company at the moment that has a 70% uh, throughput percentage because they are vertically integrated. Secondly, size does not need to be large to start with. It just needs to be large when you're done with it. Current profit needs to be round about break even or slightly below. When you're working with a company that's very profitable, you can't really make a big difference. And do these people listen to you? No, they're so clever. At the same time, you don't want to be working with a company like Premier where there is an absolute crisis and a fire going on because it's defocusing. It burns energy and it gets you off track. So people that are around about break even, sweet spot. Find companies with room to grow. Companies that have low market share or have adjacent markets that you can go into or products that can go into the same channels that you, you have at this point in time. Companies with room to deliver. CapEx, be careful. It's a lot better if this, these companies have spare capacities in their supply chain so that as you grow sales, you don't have to go and reinvent the wheel, build new factories and things like that. They just they slow you down. End user facing, very important. It's difficult to tell a retailer what to do if you don't control them. Management stability, somebody that's entrenched, that's influential, and who's a TOC champion. Find shareholder stability, long-term majority shareholders, people who can decide to share in the value uh, created. Typically, what we're talking about here are private companies, because they tend to have CEOs that tend to to be substantial shareholders or the majority shareholders. Go and look on those, those sort of spaces. So if I have to do this again, I would do it in this, this order. Target suitable companies, don't waste time. I'd run proper trials, figure out what people want. I'd reverse the direction of the, of the solution. Then very importantly, have a few successes. Nobody will back you financially unless you've shown that you can make this work one or two uh, places. So start. In, in that direction. Significantly pick viable targets, cut down the time, make them work, and then go partner. If I only made you aware of this today and got some thinking started on that, I would like to thank um, Eli specifically for the impact that he's had on, on Premier and on my and many other people's lives. And then his people on our site, um, Alan Barnard, um, Conrad Bartol. Some concluding remarks. I think Eli left us with two lessons before he passed away. He said, never say I know. 
And don't stand in my shadow, stand on my shoulders. Continuously challenge what we are doing. It was a real privilege working with Ian preparing this presentation because we had to go back and challenge some absolutely fundamental assumptions. Uh, we realized really the key starts of figuring out what will it take to get customers to be willing to pay more and buy more and designing good tests for that. Once you figure that out, you figure out the effectiveness portion. And then you can say, okay, what do we need to make that really efficient, to supply that really efficiently? Constantly checking those assumptions. We had major insights, as he said, during the project, figuring out most of the time what not to do. We could have done this much, much faster, created even more value. Thank you so much, Ian, to you and your team for working with us and preparing this. Thank you.